Welcome to the hearing of the Environmental Safety uh, and Toxic Materials Committee. We have a two-part hearing today, but we're going to be begin with our informational hearing on California Certified Unified Program Agencies, known as CUPAs. Uh, then we'll proceed to the items on our agenda today. Uh, so we'll start today with our 15-minute informational hearing from the CUPAs. The Unified Program is a state program that protects Californians from hazardous waste and uh, waste and materials at the local level. While CalEP oversees the program as a whole, it certifies local government agencies known as CUPAs to implement the hazardous waste and materials standards set by five different state agencies. I'd like to invite the representatives from the CUPAs to come up to the podium or on the dais on the table here. Uh, we have asked Justice Milan from the California Association of Environmental Health Administrators, Jim uh, uh, Bohon of Cal EPA, Randy Sawyer from the Contra Costa, Contra Costa County, and Jason uh, Bateser from Calaveras County to speak to us today about the important work that the CUPAs do in California. Thank you very much for coming to Sacramento, and uh, f um, I think we're starting. Just Mr. Chair, thanks very much. Justin Malone with KHA. You've seen me here many times before representing them, and I know for some of your members, COOP is just a four-letter word, <laughs> so we want to explain to you what those four letters mean. Uh, we have the experts here from a uh, rural and an urban uh, setting, and also Cal EPA. Uh, really, the, the significance of this program, I think, is that so much of the uh, so many of the bills that come through your committee are in some way tied to the Coopers, whether it's drinking water safe, you know, whether it's uh, underground tanks, whether it's hazardous materials, some fire safety issues. And the Cooper program is an amalgamation of many, many different elements that 23 years ago when this program was first instituted, representing scores and scores of local jurisdictions. Uh, I remember when the bill was introduced at that time, DTSC, did 17,000 inspections across the entire state. Now we're up to 50 or 60,000 a year in all the different elements. So just the boots on the ground, just the sheer number and the level of sophistication and coordination in this program is phenomenal. Um, it's highly regulated. It's, high, it's very, very significant oversight. And what we wanted to do for you and your members and your staff is to explain what we're doing in the Cooper program and uh, be a resource for you. So if you ever have any questions in those elements, you know who to come to. So pass it on to the experts in the Cooper program. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Randy Sawyer. And as I spoken before, I'm uh, the Chief Environmental Health and Hazardous Materials Officer in Contra Costa County. Uh, in 1993, the, the state legislature passed uh, Senate Bill 1082, which brought six hazardous materials programs under one local agency jurisdiction. Prior to uh, 1082, there were many different agencies implementing different programs with a duplication of efforts, for both for the agencies and the businesses who were being regulated. After the bill came into place, there was a 75 percent decrease in the number of agencies implementing programs. The local agencies implementing the programs actually became certified in 1997. They were certified by the Department of Toxic Substance Control, and they're known as the Certified Unified, Unified Program Agencies, or CUPA. There are approximately 160,000 uh, facilities that are uh, regulated under the Unified Program. And prior to 1082, as Justin mentioned, there was only about 17,000 inspections done per year. The number of uh, facility and program inspections that are now being done, I mean, it's a little bit higher than what actually Justin had said. There's, in over the last three years, there's 241,600 inspections done, and over the past year, 82,500 inspections were performed. So that goes from, it's about a five-fold increase. There was also a reduction in the number of hazardous materials injuries per 1,000 emergencies. Or, so there's about a 99.8% reduction in the amount of injury for every emergency that hazardous materials incidents were involved with. There was also a decrease of 75 percent decrease of reported ammonia and chlorine releases from 1998 to 2005. That's the last time we uh, accumulated that uh, information, but that was a 75 percent decrease because of the work we're doing, but I think also uh, a lot of the, the businesses' work they were doing to implement the programs also. The programs included a number of uh, different, as I said, six different programs that kind of come under this one umbrella. The hazardous materials release response plans and inventories, which is overseen by the State of Office of Emergency Services, and the hazardous materials plan and hazardous materials inventory statements, which is overseen by the Office of State Fire Marshal. Uh, they basically are overlap. They were very much overlapping programs. They required submittals of hazardous materials 
inventories to the local agencies. Now, now it's done, and Jim will talk a little bit more about this, and now it's done through the California Environmental Reporting System. It covers facilities from petroleum refineries to dry cleaners to farms, so all different sizes of facilities. And the information is used for emergency responders when they respond to an incident so they know what's there, so they know how to respond appropriately, and it's a right to know for the community. The Hazardous Waste Generator Program, which is overseen by the Department of Toxic Substance, oversees the handling, treatment, and disposal of hazardous waste. It includes, again, businesses from petroleum refineries to auto shops, and again, farms are also uh, uh, overseen on, from this program also. There's also the Above Ground Petroleum Storage Act, uh, which is overseen by the Office of the State Fire Marshal. It's basically regulating the storage of uh, petroleum products in above ground tanks. And it could be large oil depots or refineries, down to emergency generators and buildings, and to farms who use it for backup generators. There's also the underground storage tank, which is overseen by the State Water Quality and Resources Board. And storage of hazardous materials, as I've mentioned, in underground tanks. But most of the facilities that are regulated under this program is gasoline stations, but it could also include fire departments and other locations that store fuel in underground storage tanks. And in the California Accident Release Prevention Program, which is overseen by the Office of Emergency Service, it requires facilities that handle highly hazardous materials to implement programs to prevent the release of these materials, such as chlorine and ammonia. They, they regulate uh, large chemical manufacturers to petroleum refineries to swimming pools and to water treatment plants. Cal EPA has the overall uh, oversight of all the programs and, and, and their unified program uh, portion of the Cal EPA. The Coupa Forum, which is an association of all the Coupas and participating agencies, a participating agency is an agency that works with the Coupas that implement maybe one or two programs within their jurisdiction. Uh, basically, they, they, they've brought together and made an association called the Coupa Forum. The organization works to update and continues to improve the unified program for the agencies, businesses, and the communities. The Coupa Forum is organized in four different regions. There's a Coupa Forum board, which is uh, have elected uh, officials from each of the different agencies, plus uh, from CCDH, uh, California Department of Environmental Health uh, agencies, also from uh, CAL FIRE, and also the participate agencies. And there's also, we work together with the state in something called the Unified Program Administration and Advisory Group called UPAG. It manages basically as a management level group that works on policy, policy issues and long range planning. The Cooper Forum Board has been working with UPAG in the development of guidance for inspections, enforcement, and training framework. And the board has developed standard inspection checklists and development of technical advisory groups. The Cooper Forum Board has also developed guidance for mutual aid response recovery from disasters, an instrument panel for hazardous materials responders, and is now working to develop guidance that can assist businesses in complying with the regulations and certifying or registering unified program hazardous materials specialists. Now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Bohan. Thank you, Randy. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Jim Bohan. I am the Assistant Secretary for Local Programs and Emergency Response at Cal EPA, and I oversee the unified program statewide. Um, Cal EPA, uh, the program itself is a partnership with Cal EPA, four state agencies, and 81 COOPAs. I have one minor correction that I wanted to, to uh, insert from Randy's presentation. Um, DTSC in 1993 and through 1997 was the administrative arm that actually worked through the process of certifying, but, but the uh, secretary of Cal EPA actually is the agent that actually certifies the COOPAs and then oversees those. So today we have 81 COOPAs, and that 81 COOPAs and 25 participating agencies um, is lower than it was originally um, by, a, by quite a large factor. We've dropped 10 participating agencies and, and five COOPAs over the last um, 15 years or so, primarily because of financial reasons. They were all typically smaller cities um, that decided that, um, that they needed to be out of the program because there was a fair amount of overhead to it. The um, Secretary of Cal EPA actually did decertify one COOPA about a year and a half ago. Um, it was a city that was decertified. Um, today we have 54 environmental health departments in the state and 21 fire agencies and six other agencies that actually manage this program in partnership with the, the state agencies and Cal EPA. And the overall picture for the, the COOPA program in general is fundamentally that we have a fairly robust program with the COOPAs are managing very solid programs. Uh, and we have a very active oversight program. We actively 
uh, oversee and look at every Coupa once every three years. Um, we go through a, a very extensive process of reviewing their programs, one third of them every year, um, as Randy will, has been through four times. Um, and we typically um, find that most of the Coupas are doing well. They typically come up with a satisfactory with improvement needed, and the improvements are typically administrative in nature. Right now, we have um, nine unsatisfactory Coupas out of the 81. Of those nine, two of them will become satisfactory in about six months. They're making very good progress. Uh, of the remaining um, seven, um, most of them are actually um, small rural counties. Um, and uh, Jason will talk a little bit more about that. So our largest challenge we've had over the last five years with this program is, is to implement the Assembly Bill 2286, which is electronic reporting. It was a, a very bold step in California, and it's the only one in the nation at this point still, um, to mandate the reporting of environmental information electronically and to create a system in California that does that. That system is actually in place. It's been in place solidly since 2012. We have about 160,000 businesses currently registered in the system. Um, that number goes up and down about 10% a year as businesses go in and out of business typically. Um, we're right at almost 100% of the identified businesses actually in the system. And we're running about 80% of those businesses with active inspection records on them at this point that we can actually pull up um, electronically from a variety of different places now. Um, Randy said earlier, uh, a month ago, we were, ran over 82,000 inspections last year. Um, the vast majority of that information is now available online. Um, What's interesting about that is that um, about 2,200 businesses we found serious violations with last year. Um, of those, um, that 2,200 businesses represents about 1.4% of the overall business community. And it, it might be interesting to know that's half of the national average. So the investment we make in this program actually pays off uh, in significant dividends. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is, is um, part of the Assembly Bill 2286 was to provide transparency to the public um, with this program, and that transparency is making the information available electronically through the Internet. Um, we, are, we currently are moving forward with a project uh, called CalEnviroView. Uh, it is, in fact, a functioning system. We've had it up and operating for about a year behind our firewalls. Um, we are now in the process of building an, an and the separate instance of that outside of the firewall with information that be consumed by the general public. So the general public will have access to a large amount of information that's very controlled because we're being very careful about what kind of information we allow um, to be released in aggregate form. Individual business information is quite detailed. So pe people will be able to see what inspections happened, what the results of those inspections were, who regulates them. And CalEnviroView actually blends five separate programs together between the Water Board, the Department of Toxics, and Cal EPA, and the, and the National uh, Toxic Release Inventory Program. And so um, I said earlier that, that part of the problem we have is that we have rural jurisdictions that have significant issues. And I'm going to turn this over to Jason and let him talk about that. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Jason Bateser, Calaveras County Environmental Management Agency Administrator. Um, just some of the issues the Coupa Forum Board's working with, and once we identify issues and uh, work with our partners at Cal EPA, but recently is the long-term program viability of the Coupa program in rural areas. Uh, a lot of the rural Coupas are one or two person uh, departments, um, which is uh, difficult when you know you have um, a small business base, and uh, of I think of the there's 18 Coupas that range with uh, facilities of from 37 to 400 facilities. So when you have a small business base like that, it's hard to have fees in place to support the program imp implementation. Um, with the one or two uh, person Coupas. Um, those people have to be trained in all six program elements versus uh, an urban area where you may have a specialty person trained in underground storage tanks or the CalArt program that Randy uh, 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 mentioned. And with that, you have an increased overhead in program administration. Um, so you, you, these are just some of the challenges. And, and as we've seen um, with SIRS, which has been a, a great program, and some of the other requirements uh, that have come through, is, but we're seeing an increased administrative cost um, with the unified program. And with that, the, that is harder to pass on to that smaller business base um, in a rural area. And so 
you know, with the with that small business base and small number of uh, inspectors, you lose that one inspector, you lose 50 percent or 100 percent of your staff, or you have two, you lose 50 percent of your staff. And I think that's where we've seen a lot of the issues over the last six, seven years with people retiring. They take that knowledge with, with them. And most of the rural Coopas you're going to find are in environmental health departments versus fire departments. And those environmental health departments, they're also implementing and working on other program areas as environmental and public health concerns. Uh, come up in those rural areas. Um, and then, you know, once we get people trained in the rural area, we have uh, those urban areas uh, <laughs> recruit them and take them away from us, and that's just the reality of it. Um, and that's something, something that we face. Um, and, you know, as you look at the different rural areas, too, there's a, a, a pretty discrepancy or you see a, a difference in what the different um, agencies charge per facility. And you know, remember in your business base in the rural areas are primarily small businesses and there's that reluctance from a local level to get that full program cost recovery. So what we're looking at now is kind of with uh, Cal EPA, you know, there's 25 uh, local agencies that um, are defined by the California Rural Counties Task Force with a population under 250,000 and a, and a population center no greater than 50,000 that meet this rural definition. And we're trying to look at some long-term solutions. Um, obviously funding, you know, being a, a, a big part of that, but also looking at programmatic changes, you know, or how we could maybe, if there's if a facility, if there's areas where there's only one or two facilities, um, maybe we could contract with another county to bring resources in to implement the program. But so we're getting together. We have a work group established between uh, rural local representatives, myself, Cali PA, and, uh, and, and Justin, and try to come move forward with a solution because we see the success in the unified program implemented at the local level, and we want to make sure we continue that so we don't have this up and down <laughs> effect in, in rural areas. So that's kind of, you know, where, where our big, um, our next big challenge is for the Coupa Forum Board this next year and, and with Cali PA, and it's near and dear to my heart uh, representing the northern region and obviously being from Calaveras County, so. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much for that information. So when, when should uh, this committee expect to hear back on any recommendations that your, your committee, uh, your working group, um, um, decides to move forward? Our goal is to have something put together by August. Was, um, and so that's kind of where we're at at this point in time. So at that point in time, we'd like to, we could come back. It's, it might be a little bit difficult for Jim to speak to it because we would like to go through the budget change proposal we would make an appeal to Cali PA to do this as a general fund augmentation. There is a small general fund augmentation of seven to eight hundred thousand dollars right now in place, but that doesn't cover this by any means. If if it's for whatever reason not possible to go through a BCP, we would like to bring a bill to uh, maybe through this committee or certainly will come through this committee to look at ways of restructuring the the general fund subvention or support of these rural jurisdictions that rural jurisdictions that simply don't have the fee base. You had a question, Vice Chairman Dolly. So thank you for this hearing. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, the reason I asked to be on this committee is for exactly this. I came out of county government for 16 years and worked with, and I live out in a very rural place where, let me just give you an example, we have one service station that you can get your tires fixed and, you know, get your oil changed and fix wheel bearings and that kind of stuff, and, you know, so they're regulated by the Coupa. Um, it's 75 miles away from the county seat where the health inspector comes from. So, and it, so there's not a big base for business. There's no other place to go. But he's being regulated. Now, the environmental impact of his business in this large geographic area is probably pretty minute. He had buried tanks there. Eventually, they removed those. He's been trying to keep up. But the, but the cost for him to, to stay in business and the cost for the county to implement the Coupa is expensive because there's just not enough businesses. It's a 4,500-square-mile county that I live in, and there's one health officer that I'm aware of, and business is spread over 200 miles. So if there's some way to be able to evaluate the risk of the, to the environment by having these few spread out businesses out there, really 
their impact on the environment is not as much as where you have a bunch of accumulated businesses who could, could have a, an environmental impact, as we see with development. So I would, you know, be interested in if there was a way that we could assess the risk. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, those of us who care about the environment want to know what the risk is and what we're paying for and make sure that we're taking care of the environment, but also be able to keep those um, businesses there so that, that we can access them and the traveling public and those types. So um, I commend you on doing what you do. It's very tough, and, and a lot, large part of my district um, is covered by these little communities out there who have one or two businesses that are heavily regulated, and the price is high because of the wages that they have to pay to keep the, the people there. So, And there's not enough to spread the cost. So you, you stated it correctly, but I would be interested in maybe some out-of-the-box thinking type ways of looking at the risk to the environment versus – how big the area is and what really, um, you know, the regulation side of it. Can we move to ease up on that some? Thank you. Well, I, I do want to say, if I may, um, we completely agree, and that is the quandary that we have right now, but we don't want to form an A and a B team. Uh, environmental health, speaking for CCDH and the environmental health, we have resisted strenuously to have this idea of, oh, because you're in a rural jurisdiction, we're going to relax the standards or we're going to give you a lesser treatment or whatever the case is. So... Those standards apply across the board. If they're good for L.A., they're good for whatever jurisdiction. What we're looking for is a way to make that service delivery at the same standard but more efficient in such a way that we don't have to put a huge financial burden on that small fee base. That's, that's the challenge. I would, I would agree. But if you lived out there and you didn't have a place to get your vehicle fixed and it's gone, you're not going to like that A-team because it just puts you out of business, and then there's no place to go. It's, and if you're the disadvantaged, low-income person who can't travel, which there's a bunch of those folks too, now you're at a real disadvantage. And, you know, we talk about, you know, environmental justice. I think that this is one of those cases where the environmental justice has went the other way and actually penalizes you because you can't meet the standards that I, in, in some cases in, are very erroneous and expensive for business to be able to stay uh, with, the, with the lack of the uh, small amount of people that are able to access that. So I understand where you're coming from, but I think there has to be some common sense approach to look at the environment and say, are we really hammering the environment? Where you have the cumulative impacts of business after business who are in a, in a watershed, for example, you may have, you may have a, a higher risk there. And then there's a justification for that. So I just ask that you have an open mind and that you take into consideration that there are a lot of disadvantaged folks out in these small communities who can't travel 75 miles to get their tires rotated or tires on their car. And that, that's, to me, not fair. And uh, just to speak of that, I've always thought uh, there's that rural environmental justice component, too, especially uh, this past year in Calaveras County in the recovery of the Butte Fire. We had one gas station that served about a 16-mile radius that was, uh, without it, it's very low throughput, but without it, the recovery wouldn't have been um, as quick as we had in, in uh, cleaning up the properties and getting people back in. So I know exactly what you're talking about there. And I want to say thank you for uh, the input. I actually chair the work group that we're working with this on. And so I'll, I'll take the information back to the work group with me. Uh, and the, the concept of thinking out of the box is exactly what we're trying to do, um, obviously within the, the regulatory structure we have to deal with, but outside the box. Thank you. Well, we, we appreciate the time. This committee uh, takes seriously our oversight role to make sure our local jurisdictions are kind of uh, – you know, we're also um, – trying to be on the same page and support some of the local efforts so that we're carrying our responsibilities laid out in policy here in Sacramento that is making sure it's working on, on the local level. And as new challenges ap approach Coopas, I mean, that's what we're looking for, your expertise and your guidance of what changes can we make or, or resources can we um, look to to hopefully make them function better. So with that, uh, we're going to end this informational hearing. Um, any last comments from any committee members? Um, otherwise, I want to thank you for your presentation, and we look forward to hearing back from your recommendations as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, we do have a quorum present, so we're going to ask for a roll call so we can establish quorum for our second part of our meeting, which we have several, four bills, um, well, several bills on our agenda today. Alejo? Uh, present. Alejo, present. Dali? Here. Dali is here. Arambula. Arambula here. Gaines. Gray. 
Lopez, McCarty. Here. McCarty's here. So we have a quorum. Okay, um, quorum is established. Um, we'll start with our consent calendar. We have two bills on consent. Uh, we, we have a motion. Second. We have a second. The motion for SB 820 uh, by Senator Hertzberg uh, do pass to the Assembly Judiciary Committee and SB 930 by Senator Gaines um, do pass to the Assembly Appropriations Committee. We have a motion and a second. Madam Secretary, if we could uh, call the roll on the consent calendar. Okay, the motion on SB 820 is due pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary with a recommendation to consent calendar. And the motion on SB 930 is due pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Appropriations with a recommendation to the consent calendar. Alejo? Aye. Alejo, aye. Dali? Aye. Dali, aye. Arambula? Aye. Arambula, aye. Gaines? Gray? Lopez? McCarty? Aye. McCarty, aye. So that's four. Uh, the consent has uh, four votes. Those bills are out. We'll keep the roll open for missing members to add on. 